Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Emerge presentation. Uh, this is the budget-friendly security solution you'll wish you knew about last year. Uh, we're going to talk today about Cisco, No Before, and kind of the, the security uh, solutions that, that we see being very beneficial for folks. So I'm going to take a moment and introduce you to our, uh, our two uh, presenters today. We have Jeff Aiken. Uh, he is our VCIO here at Emerge and our resident expert on Know Before. And Joe Frank, who is our data center manager. And we'll talk us through a lot of the, uh, the, the Cisco uh, solutions out there. So first off, I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to, uh, to Joe to introduce, uh, we're going to show a uh, quick video. So, Joe, take it away. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, the video is going to depict uh, what a lot of people today see as a common attack vector. Uh, that is uh, phishing, or, or more, more specifically known as what's called spear phishing, uh, where they're targeting certain individuals in an organization in order to social engineer uh, an attack. So the video will kind of walk us through what that process looks like, some of the work behind the scenes, and uh, from there, understand the, the, the devastation that can occur within an organization. How did you decide to become a hacker? <laughs> well, I'm not really sure what it means to become a hacker. That's like some guy in a hoodie who types really fast and stays up all night writing code and cracking passwords. It's not me. I just spy on people and see what makes them click. It's not a bad job. Mark Hanning, CEO of Qualicart, said to report earnings after their blockbuster IP. So you consider this a job? I put a lot of work into this. I'm not lazy. It takes research to figure out the key players and learn all about them, their families, their friends, what they care about. You have to understand the company's organization. I get a lot of my information from the sales department because they're always so quick and eager. They're hungry. People trust too easily. They don't look at the details. I do. Details matter. That's what I'm good at. It has to look completely believable. It has to look familiar. This is where research is important. It's not some generic piece of spam. It's an email from their boss with their company's signature. It's written in the voice of the boss. It's what he would say if he were writing this. What about the malware itself? How does that work? Somebody else out there already wrote all the code that does the actual attack. I'm just using it in the attachment. My skill is in my ability to get a bunch of people to click on that attachment. I always wonder what it's like when the whole thing unfolds on their end, when the panic sets in. Please leave your message after the beep. Hey, this is Rajiv in finance. Call me as soon as you get this. Something's up with my laptop. I can't Katie, are you on your way to the office? Something's going on with our file uh, server. This is the Karen in HR. Our benefits dashboard seems really slow. We're getting calls from users on it. Currently, there is a malware attack targeting our main... It's ransomware. They're holding us hostage. We're locked out of everything. I, I can't even check my phone. What about the backup? That will take days. We need this fixed now. Just pay it. We don't have a choice. We're reporting earnings in two hours. But how do we know Just that they'll... pay it. Put every single person on getting us back up and running. That's the only priority now. Okay, it's done. I have the decrypt key. to distract us. They got inside. They got everything. Customer data, financials, everything. Qualicart is reeling today from the news that hackers have released the personal information of nearly the 2 The Nasdaq million. closed lower today, led by Qualicart, which was down 14% on news that their recent data breach may be far worse than the company originally stock fell to a new all-time low on news that CEO Mark Hanning is stepping down after what is turning out to be one of the worst breaches of personal information in recent history. Do you feel bad about releasing the personal information? All the financials? All the money that was lost? 
All I did was get the files. I'm not the one that decided to release them. I'm not the one that shorted the stock. Somebody else had their reasons for that. It's above my pay grade. I was paid to do a job and I did it well. And that's what's expected of anyone, isn't it? Anyway, markets bounce back. So as you can see from the video, uh, it's a pretty elaborate operation on the backside for, for how companies get attacked and, and the devastation that can occur. So according to Norton Security, the United States holds the first place in the ranks of top countries that are targeted with cybersecurity attacks. Um, it probably doesn't come as a surprise to most folks uh, when you look at the attack vector uh, from firewall information, from malware, you, you do see a lot of it coming from uh, other countries into the U.S. Uh, and the attacks uh, that are occurring. So. All right, awesome. Thanks, Joe. And next up is you again. Uh, tell us about Umbrella, the open DNS solution that we're, that we're talking about today. So some of you may be more familiar with the term open DNS. Uh, open DNS has been around for quite some time. Uh, they came up with a, a solution to to protect some folks, um, and, and obviously Cisco has has purchased that organization, and now it's called Umbrella. So that's why you see the, the term is somewhat synonymous. So over the past five years, uh, security breaches have increased by 67% according to Accenture's global survey. Uh, probably not a surprise. Uh, we hear more and more about it, even in the news every day. Uh, we're more mindful of it. Uh, and ransomware attacks occur every 14 seconds and is estimated to increase by to 11 seconds by 2021. Uh, again, this is increasing in frequency, not decreasing. Uh, the risk is greater and greater. So um, moving on, cybercrime tools and kits can be purchased for as little as $1 on the dark web and online marketplaces. So as you saw from the video, all she had to do was craft the social engineering side of it uh, the tools to execute the attack were pre-built. So she just selected that attachment and sent that along as a renamed attachment and that's what caused the damage. So, so furthering on to Umbrella, uh, Umbrella gives us somewhat of a first line of defense uh, on what's commonly used in the internet for, as known as DNS. So DNS translates basically your Microsoft.com in, into a, a language, basically, that the computer uses to reach the destination. So basically what happens is uh, when a user clicks on something and goes to a web page, it, it translates the name Microsoft or Intel or, or um, whatever the case is, MSNBC, um, it, it goes out, takes that name, it queries a uh, system on the internet known as a DNS server. It brings back some information and then the actually the computer actually talks that destination. What Umbrella does is it, it will filter out some of those bad bad places on the internet and, and we'll take it down to that level as being you know what's bad or what's good. Sometimes that's a gray area but generally we know where it's bad for sure. So Umbrella protects the users from even getting the information to go to the bad places. If it's... Sorry, Joe, um, I have a question that came in here. Um, so will Umbrella slow down our workstations? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, what's gonna happen is the DNS request will, will follow a similar path as it would in the past before implementing Umbrella. And what it will do is it'll it'll process the request the same way. So local workstations won't be affected from a, from a speed standpoint, uh, but the query process in the cloud is a very, very quick process. So uh, what it's gonna do is it's gonna protect those users from going to those bad places before they even uh, are able to get an attachment or to uh, go to a, a place that, that's bad. Um, you know, one thing that, that Umbrella can do too is provide you control over where users can go. Not only the bad places, but, but places maybe that aren't maybe work appropriate or environmentally, organizationally appropriate. 
uh, and gives you a level of control on that and visibility. So now with Umbrella, we can see, you know, maybe people have been have been fished, they've been tempted by either an email or a website or something else. They've clicked on something that says, hey, this is a bad place or this is a risky uh, connection. So now we can see historical data around the users that are doing that, around the, um, the systems that are doing it, and it provides an opportunity for us to either train users to, on what to look for um, if it's something that might be tricky. So the social engineering side of, of the attack is where it's going to be. It's not somebody attacking your firewall looking for vulnerabilities today. It's now searching for uh, a susceptible target inside the organization. So uh, Umbrella can help us mitigate the attack uh, before it becomes a threat. So now we have uh, cloud-based tools to help protect us uh, against those potential attacks and bringing that malware uh, into our organizations. All right, perfect. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm going to send it on over to Jeff now, going to talk about uh, know before and end user training, which I, I think is the, the other really important component of, uh, of protecting your organization. Go for it, Jeff. Absolutely. So training is a, is a critical piece here. So 91% of successful data breaches start with the spear phishing attack, and that's where that training comes in. You need to be able to spot those um, before you fall victim to them. So then $133,000, that's the average cost of a ransomware attack is $133,000. Um, most businesses can't afford to, you know, to lose that money. So that's 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 huge. And then 34% um, of businesses hit with a malware attack take uh, a week or more to recover. And uh, you know, certainly that's factoring into that cost as well as that time. Jeff, I have a question here, um, and this might be a little bit for both. We're just talking about security in general. But uh, the, the question that came in was, why isn't a traditional firewall and endpoint protection enough? So I can take that. Uh, first of all, 75% of companies infected with malware were running up-to-date endpoint protection. And then uh, the majority of the threats now are not coming in. They're, they're not viruses and worms coming in through a, you know, a, a firewall. They're coming in the form of targeting or phishing emails. Hackers are targeting CEOs, CFOs, and anyone in the company, honestly, that has access to funds or sensitive information. Um, let me just run through a, a quick threat that we, we see all too often here. Uh, a user and account receivable receives an email from Office 65 outlining some sort of an urgent problem with their mailbox, maybe their quote or something along those lines. Uh, the email looks identical to an email from Microsoft, so the end user doesn't even think twice about it. It even has a link to the Office 365 portal for the end user to log into. The accounts receivable person clicks on this link, and it takes them to what appears to be an Office 365 login, only it's not. It's a fake page that the hackers have set up to capture that person's credentials. To make it worse, it's actually a man-in-the-middle attack. And a man-in-the-middle attack means it's basically going to take those credentials, it's going to capture them, and then it's actually going to pass them along to the actual Microsoft website so that the user's experience is identical to logging into Office 65. They're going to go straight to their, their Outlook uh, online as if nothing happened. It's going to look completely normal to them, and they're not going to think anything of it. Meanwhile, in the background, the hackers have now have complete control over that person's email account. They set up forwarding rules. Um, so they forward emails to themselves. They're looking for keywords like purchase order, remit, or invoice, or payment, and, and those types of things. Uh, they then begin responding to your clients almost in real time um, you know, with you know, responses to, to those emails that are coming in that say, like, we recently changed our payment processing information. Um, please update your records and send all payments to this new ACH routing number. Um, and then your vendors who are accustomed to receiving these types of emails from this person in accounts receivable, and why, you know, why should they question it? It's the user's email signatures is in there, and it actually came from that, that, that user's uh, email account. 
So your vendors are now paying the hackers for services that you provided. And, and to make this all worse is it actually brings up an interesting dilemma as to, you know, who's at fault? Uh, you know, they certainly sent the payment to the wrong person, but you were compromised and you told them to send it to the wrong person. So, uh, interestingly enough, the city of Chicago back in April was scammed out of over a million dollars by hackers pretending to be the cleaning vendor that provides custodial services um, for both Midway and O'Hare airports. So, sure. Jeff, that actually I, I do a lot of uh, research and digging around and, you know, in regards to state and local governments, I saw a fact saying that there was going, you know, there was a five-fold increase mm -hmm. in phishing attacks over the past few years. So, why why that much of an increase and why, you know, particularly like state and local governments, like you were saying with Chicago, why are they being targeted? Well, so I think, you know, as with any any industry in any business, you know, number one, we have a distracted workforce. Uh, they're trying to multitask and they're oftentimes not focused on any one thing. So they're not really, honestly, they're not th uh, thinking before they click on that funny cat video with the malware that's embedded in it, right? So then number two, we've also got cloud-based email. So Office 65 is pretty much the, the normal uh, email platform out there for, for most businesses. And a lot of businesses believe that the standard filtering that's built into Office 65 is, is enough. It's quite, you know, quite honestly not. It does provide some protection, but it's not nearly enough. And as with every security problem, it's all about the layers. You need a good email filter to remove as much of this malicious email as possible. And even the stuff that does get through, that's where the training comes in and, and know before can you know, certainly help you out with that. And then we also have you know, a lack of funding. Um, state and local governments have very tight budgets and oftentimes cybersecurity and training is an afterthought. Uh, we also have you know, sim simply ease of access. Government officials want to be accessible. The more they're in the public eye, the more likely they are to be reelected. And you combine that with uh, open records uh, and ease of information, and it's very easy for hackers to get just enough uh, information and that, that one nugget that actually helps them you know, craft a very credible social engineering attack. And then we also have uh, a shortage of qualified security professionals. Unemployment in the IT sector is an all-time low with less than 3% unemployment. And, and they say that there's actually not enough qualified security professionals to cover the Fortune 500 companies, yet alone the rest of the businesses in the U.S. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah. I, I'm going to just completely, this is just going to be our talk now, Jeff. <laughs> so, I, I guess the, the, the question for that is just why know before? Why even have end user training? Why isn't it just enough to send out an email telling everybody, beware of phishing attacks, here's what it is? And that's the end of it. Like, why, why, why is end user training such an important layer in this? Well, so your employees are going to be tested every day by the hackers. They're sending the phishing and the spear phishing emails to your end users. If you don't train them on how to recognize these threats, eventually one of them is going to be compromised, and just one of them could, you know, cost you that average of one hundred and thirty-three thousand um, dollars. Honestly, it'd be like walking into your first day of freshman English, and the teacher gives you the end of the year exam. You know, how fair is that? How are you supposed to know the answers to questions you haven't studied? Know before gives you the ability to test your user base, identify the weak spots, then train everyone, and then retest to assess the progress. And that's the really important thing is, you know, train them, test them, and then assess the progress, and then retrain, you know, retest and reassess. Um, specifically, uh, companies that um, you know utilize this uh, program on average, they'll go from you know 30% fish prone to just 2% fish prone in 12 months. So it, it really gives you the ability to, like I said, test and then assess the results. And the only way to achieve the results desired to is, is to train your end users and then test them to confirm the training is working. Cool. Um, so, I'm going to send it back over to Joe. Thanks for that, Jeff. Sure. That incredibly informative. Um, so, the, the last kind of layer that we're going to talk about uh, is going to be with Joe again, and we're going to talk about Duo, the uh, multi-factor authentication. So, yeah, Joe, tell us about Duo. So, I want to 
piggyback on some of the things that Jeff just said. Uh, we talked about man in the middle attacks. We talked about passing credentials. This is all technical process, and we're all very familiar with keeping our passwords and, and to the point where we're putting them on stickies, we're putting them on our keyboards, we're putting them in different places. You know, how accessible is your online identity? So for most organizations, they know that you are who you are. You are Jay Murphy, you are, you know, um, Jeff Aiken or Jay Aiken or Jay Frank. They understand those naming conventions really well. So they can, they can understand your email um, format. All they need is a password. So how do they get that? So they, they use many different methods to, to get that. They use phishing attacks. They use, you know, online, it's, you know, hopefully malware, different viruses. They're trying to get information. They're trying to get the key to the front door. That's all they want. They want to get inside. Once they're inside, now they can pretty much wreak havoc, shut down your business, you know, take over your business, exploit it, et cetera. Um, so, you know, you go back to the man in the middle, you provide your credentials. Now that wasn't Office 365. Now the bad guys have your credentials to get in the front door. They basically have the door to your lock and they know what locks uh, to use that key on. This takes it to the next step. How do we truly um, validate an identity? So Duo uh, is, um, has been around for a long time. They're a multi-factor authentication organization. That's their focus uh, around security. So really what they do is that man in the middle attack, if, if we had Duo in that scenario, um, the man in the middle attack says, give me username, give me password. I'm going to pass that to Microsoft. Well, wait a minute. Now Microsoft is actually asking for more information. They need uh, a validation from either a physical token, and you've heard those, those terms in the past from RSA, the physical tokens you have, but now we have apps on our phones that go back to a device that's attached to the person, a physical device, whether it be a desk phone, whether it be an app on a cell phone, those kind of things, to where it says, is this truly you logging in? you have to approve or deny that login. So it's going to thwart that attempt because they only have part of the solution uh, or part of the key. Um, they, they may get into one layer or, or see access to one layer, but we can take Duo multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication and extend that to other parts of the environment, not just cloud apps like the Office 365 popularity uh, but that is a very, very common attack point. Uh, you can also extend it into things like Azure, AWS, things like WordPress, uh, remote access VPNs, um, you know, even down to the workstation level. So there are many, many layers, both cloud applications and on-premise applications that can be protected by a second factor. And, and really that's going to further ensure identity of the person who is accessing that data or accessing the application. And, and like Jeff spoke of, this is about layers. So this is another layer to ensure that security. Uh, we see a lot of times where the CXO of the company, who's very busy running the business, running the company, uh, are, the, um, are the targets of these attacks because it's, it's generally more difficult to filter through a lot of that because they have so much data coming in. It's easier for a miss to occur. Uh, hopefully the training that they have will help, but they're, they're an easier attack person. They're not going to send an, a phishing email to the IT director in most, most cases or the IT administrators because they're, they're going to look for those type of things. Um, so when, when those people are compromised, they go to a website, they put in the credentials, and boom, now they have the keys of the kingdom. The second factor prevents that from happening. Uh, they may have it, they may have the password, but the applications, the, the cloud and on-prem applications uh, and data are secured by that second factor. Uh, that second factor also allows us to um, better control the devices that the user would use from a technical standpoint, whether the device is compromised. We can lock the device, we can uh, have visibility to where they log in from. So if, hey, wait a minute, if, if Jeff is not traveling, 
to China and I see a login attempt from China, I can immediately block that because I know Jeff would never be coming from China. So we have control and policy to help us uh, filter through where users can app, uh, actually log in from or access our data through. So Duo allows us to, uh, to again, extend that authentication, that identity verification to another level uh, and has prevented many, many uh, successful, uh, potentially successful attacks by implementing Duo. All right, uh, Joe, I have a question here. Um, so th we use Microsoft Authenticator for Office 365 access today. What is the benefit of switching over to Duo? So uh, obviously, um, you know, Microsoft does have a built-in authentication uh, application and product that will um, authenticate through Office 365 alone if you have the tendency. Uh, if you want the extended capabilities of other cloud applications and of on-premise applications, you, you need a, a product that supports that. And, and Duo has been around you know, for quite some time, uh, and this is all that they do. There is um, you know, the capability to, I'll say, in my opinion, um, have better control and visibility through the Duo dedicated platform versus the Microsoft platform. There's some level of control, some level of visibility, but not to the extent that we have it with Duo. And, and having been in both, both environments, um, the, Duo, the Duo process is going to be uh, much better serving for, for certainly larger organizations. Awesome. Um, we have a couple other questions to get through. I think this is uh, going back to Umbrella here. Um, so we use NextGen Firewall today. How does this add value beyond those protections? So next-gen firewall, I'll say, is, is, a, is a part of the layer. Um, you know, you don't want folks to be able to walk right in the front door, so you need to be able to lock the front door and be able to control who comes in and out. That's really what a firewall is doing. Um, you know, the umbrella component of this is the users. The users have become the, the target of the attack. It is no longer the, the network perimeter. It's not, you know, trying to log into a local PC, it's getting someone to give you something that you can use to get more. And, and this is where Umbrella hopefully will help stop that person from going to a bad place that's going to uh, harvest information from them, which is, which is essentially what they're doing. So the next gen firewall, certainly, you gotta have a firewall if you're connected to the internet just to protect all the bad guys from just walking through the, the front door, um, and, and that helps. And next gen has things like IPS on it, they've got some URL filtering, things like that, that's all good. You know, the, the really, you know, the, the, I'll say the best part is, you know, this is all under the Cisco, uh, the Cisco brand, and, and there's a lot of connectivities between these applications and between the pane of glass for management that are more seamless than using multiple different products. And, and Duo, I'm sorry, Umbrella will give us that, um, you know, visibility we need in, you know, hopefully with uh, the other Cisco type products like their own next gen firewall, this is, uh, you know, kind of the topology that they use. All right, great. I have a couple more, I think, going back to uh, Duo. Uh, does Duo require physical key fobs to be distributed? Thank goodness, no. <laughs> uh, not a requirement, it is an option. Um, you know, sometimes there are, are different methods for ensuring that identity, um, what's called a, a 2FA device, that can be uh, your desk phone, it can be a cell phone, it can be a key, a physical key fob. Um, it, it needs to follow the policy, the security policy of your organization. And with Duo, we have the flexibility to integrate different methodology for, for accessing that second factor. All right, great. Um, I have one here. Uh, we currently use anti-X protection on our endpoints. Isn't this the same concept? I guess going back to you talking about umbrella. Sure. So you know the the greatest challenge is the social engineering aspect of of this discussion entirely. Is they're they're attacking people. Um, you know the anti-X type components. Your your typical 
uh, virus protection, malware protection, is looking for things when it's on your computer. So it, it would have had to have reached that endpoint before those products can be effective. What Umbrella does is it prevents users from going out to those bad places to bring that bad code in to execute. Uh, so, so basically, it's nice to have that bottom line layer in case it does get to you, but Umbrella is going to prevent, in a lot of cases, from you getting to those places that provide that bad stuff. All right, great. And I have uh, one final question that came in, uh, and I think this actually kind of ties it up well with uh, you know speaking to the, the budget-friendly aspect to the, this multi-layer solution. Uh, is multi-factor authentication expensive to deploy and maintain? So, you know, it, it can be it can be less expensive, it can be more expensive. The general the general consensus is regardless of the product set that you choose, whether it be Duo or another vendor, it's it's you can you can count a few dollars per month per user uh, in that range, depending on the type of visibility or the type of control or the type of uh, integration levels you want, um, whether it be an uh, an uplift in the Microsoft licensing side. Uh, that includes additional functionalities, or it is, um, you know, a Duo product. So it's going to be a few dollars per person per user, uh, which in obviously large organizations that, that does that up quickly, we understand that. But if it's a large organization, that $133,000 due to a loss can be 10 times or even 100 times that number. So it, there is a cost to, to combat the, the threat, but now they found a new threat vector, which is the individual. So this is this is kind of the territory that they're uh, they're in, and firewall isn't going to do the do the job anymore. So perfect. All right, well, we have one more slide here, um, and I'll kind of throw it back over to Jeff since he is our uh, resident know before expert. Uh, Jeff, can you tell him a little bit about the uh, the demo that we're offering? So sure, um, we can actually set up a fully functional demo in uh, in your environment um, with your assistance. Um, we need, uh, we'll send you instructions on how to allow the know before emails to bypass your spam and clutter filters so that they actually make it to the end users. It doesn't do us any good if the uh, emails don't make it to the end users. Once that is set up, all we need is a, uh, a list of email addresses that you want us to uh, populate into our system, and we'll set up a, a free fish test uh, to send out to those users over a period of time, you know, a month, two months, whatever, whatever the case may be. We can make those emails um, all very similar, or we can make them random. One of the nice features about Know Before is it has thousands of different email templates that are updated constantly. It's, it's also uh, very socially driven by the end users. So end users can actually submit their own email templates, their own phishing emails to be uh, populated out for you know, the, the user community to use. They also uh, take advantage of uh, uh, current events. So current events, uh, you know, if there's something specifically going on, like the, you know, we recently had um, the, you know, London terror attack, right? So they'll take advantage of something like that, like donate to the Red Cross now to help this or, or whatever the case may be that's going on. So with that trial, like I said, we'll set up a free fish test and give you a report as to, you know, how fish prone your, your end users are. And then uh, just contact either myself or you know register through this event, and uh, we can get that uh, working for you. All right, perfect. Well, I haven't had any other uh, questions come in, so we will go ahead and wrap up for today. So, Joe, Jeff, thank you so much for uh, for your time and your expertise. And uh, following this, uh, we'll go ahead and send out an email with this event link and a couple of interesting uh, case studies that might be, uh, be relevant to you. So thank you so much for your time and have a good day.